All right. Now, there's three ways in which we study uh, the embryological as well as the regenerative um, aspects of developmental biology. And in, throughout history, they kind of go in this order. They started with the anatomical approach, then they went to the experimental approach. Now we're at the stage where we can manipulate genetics so well that genetics is mostly used to study developmental biology. However, all of these have their place even today in uh, studying development. However, most of what we are learning today has to do with genetic, the genetic approach to embryology rather than just the anatomical experimental approach. So I'm going to explain all three of these. Anatomical. Um, scientists have been studying the structure of, uh, of embryos for a long time. I mean, even before microscopes were invented, you can see and actually trace, um, uh, especially with chicken embryos, um, since you can open up the, the, the um, shell at certain stages, and see the anatomy at a particular stage. So the first anatomical approach is what we call comparative embryology, um, which is comparing organisms, different species, based upon uh, uh, their stages of development. And they found that in some species, like in humans and chickens and, and mice and things of that sort, that there are certain stages that are almost identical in terms of what's happening. Again, it doesn't tell you the genetics behind it or other things. It's just more of a physical approach to saying, oh, here's when the limbs are forming. Oh, and it forms right here in the mouse. And oh, it forms right here in the humans and so on and so forth. So it's more of comparing the overall structures um, to get a good idea as far as what's forming when and, and so on and so forth. Again, there's a limitation to what you can derive by comparative embryology. But there are some questions that can be answered with that. Evolutionary biology, by comparing closely related species to one another, and again, looking at some of the morphological differences between their anatomy. That's another way which we can kind of study a little bit about some of the differences between development in one organism or another. Probably the more useful approach today that's still used because of the nature of uh, studies on humans where we don't do experimental or genetic studies on humans, um, at least not in the US, um, is teratology. So what is teratology? It's basically the study of birth defects. And by studying birth defects, this tells us a lot about what's going on to development. For example, why do you have to have folic acid? Why do we need to supplement folic acid for uh, some women um, to prevent things like spina bifida? It's because we've seen that when there's an absence of this, we, we have that particular uh, um, problem occurring. Now, due to genetic studies, we know why that's the case. But um, teratology essentially says, oh, uh, you were exposed to this during the pregnancy and, and the child has this problem. OK, there must be some correlation there. So teratology is still used today because when things pop up, when abnormalities pop up in the uh, structures of humans especially, then we say, well, you know, what was it? about the mother's pregnancy, was it there something, was there an environmental condition, is there a genetic cause to this, that ultimately has a correlation. It's kind of like when your car won't start, you know that there are several things that are associated with the car's ignition and it's starting, and you know you can say, well, what has the car been through? Oh, it's really cold outside, it's probably having to do with this. So it's the same thing as trying to diagnose what's going on based upon certain abnormalities um, uh, of development. So teratology is essentially the study of birth defects. And that's taught us quite a bit about human development. Now, I'm not really going to test you on mathematical modeling, but it's, a, it's one of those that's kind of up and coming. Um, I've never used it, but ultimately, it's a way of making predictions of how uh, structures form. There is a form of mathematical symmetry in life when you look at certain structures. Uh, certain flowers have a, a, a certain mathematical relationship to them uh, in their development. And so mathematical modeling is one of those things where they can take what we know and try to use the, the mathematics behind it to predict how things are supposed to form and get more information along that line. It's very complex, um, but there are a number of individuals that are working out those, those formulas to do so. 
I mean, math has its role in biology in that, you know, even the relationship between the blood pressure and the dilation of your blood vessels, there's a mathematical relationship that is absolute between that. So we can use math to ultimately make predictions about um, how structures should form and thereby understand more about development in that regard. Now, again, this is one of the more primitive approaches. It's not quite used as much today because we learn so much more with the experimental and the genetic approaches. So let's get into those. The experimental approach, there's two main ways in which we do experiments. Now, in these experiments, there really is no genetic manipulation. It's merely uh, changing the position of, of cells. And when I say change the positions, I also mean just complete removal of the cells. Because one of the things that we find with experimental uh, uh, embryology is that if you remove certain parts of the cells during a particular stage, the other cells can actually compensate for that and regenerate that tissue, which tells us that those cells aren't fully, uh, haven't fully received their fate yet. But in some cases, when we remove certain cells at a particular stage, then that part's just gone. It never forms during the development. So when we do experiments where we take parts away, when we cut off a limb and it doesn't regenerate at a, at a certain stage or whatnot, we know, hey, at this point, these cells have become committed, nothing else can replace them, they're gone. In other cases, you can remove a huge chunk, like in the frog embryo, you can come in here and remove a huge chunk of it and it'll just renew it. It'll just regenerate the whole chunk again and, and it'll be just fine. So experiment, that's one, ablation, is the removal. Uh, if you think obliterate or ablation, I don't know, however, whatever you want to use to use the, for some type of a mnemonic, ablation is the destruction or removal. Uh, sometimes it's just the destruction of. You don't actually remove the cells, you just kill the cells. And there's different things you can learn from that. But ablation is the removal or destruction of cells in an, in an embryo. Transplantation is one of those where if the species is closely related. For example, I, I've uh, um, read a number of articles, I never did it myself, but I read a number of articles where quails and chicken embryos, they're so similar genetically and in, in, in terms of their embryology that you can transplant cells and they'll behave just fine. Well, I'll explain how that's useful in, in a little bit, but we can actually take cells from one embryo and put it into another, take cells from another embryo and put it into another. It doesn't always have to be from different species. It can be within the same species, and that tells us a lot, too. We can take cells from down here in the somite region and put them up by the head and see what they do, or vice versa. And what we find when we do that, when we transplant cells from one part to another, is, again, we find out whether those cells have the potential to become that part of the head, you know, part of the brain or part of the skin or whatnot. Because there comes a point where the cells differentiate and can no longer take on a different fate. For example, if you take cells from here and put them up to the head, they'll try to form muscle instead of brain at this point in the embryo's development. If you do it earlier on, then they're like, all right, fine, I'm going to be part of the brain. So they haven't fully differentiated at that point, and there's a lot we can learn from these type of transplantation experiments. Okay, so transplantation can be within the same embryo, or it can actually be between different species, if they're closely related enough. In fact, frogs and salamanders are closely related enough that we can interchange cells between them, and they will become part of the embryo. They won't necessarily form correctly. Again, that's another interesting experiment we'll go over. But we can do that. So transplantation is exchange of cells within an organism or between organisms. To, to find out, to ask some question, and to find out the answer. Ablation is the destruction or removal of cells from an embryo to ask a particular question. And that's really what these experiments are doing, is to ask the question of how does the brain form? How does the spinal column form? How do the muscles form? What are the factors in that? Now, the genetic is the one that's most commonly used today and gives us the most information. We still do experimental and anatomical approaches, but genetics is where it's at. 
that's where I spent most of my PhD work is on genetic changes. So the first one is straightforward mutagenesis, which is to cause mutations in a gene and then see what happens. It's, let's say you didn't know how a car worked. You go in and you rip out the radiator. <laughs> then you're going to see what happens after that and say, well, this is what the radiator is associated with, all of these different things with the car. Or you go in and you rip out the battery. Oh, it won't start now. So that's really what we do with genetics is we'll go in, we'll mutate a gene, and then we'll see what problems arise from that. Okay? Sometimes nature does it for us. Sometimes nature will modify something. We'll say, hey, this is different than that. And then we'll do something like phylogenetics where we'll look at the different mutations between species and say, oh, this is why this insect produces wings and this is why this insect produces legs because of this mutagenesis that occurred naturally. So mutagenesis is just about mutations and then the results in the embryo due to that mutation. Transgenics. This is one where just like a transgenic organism is one that has a foreign gene inserted into it, transgenics is when we insert uh, some gene. Now the gene can come from the same embryo where we say, hey, this gene is not normally expressed in these cells. I'm going to make it so that it is. And that's what I did for my PhD work is I artificially made cells that normally wouldn't express this gene to express it. Because I wanted to see if that gene made it so that those cells became neurons. And we found that at a particular stage they could, after a later stage they couldn't. So there was a window opportunity where the cells could change their fate in some areas of the embryo. Um, or it could be done between different species. We can take um, one gene from one species and put it in another and say, well, what does this do? Um, one of the more common transgenics that we do is just a labeling where we put GFP or YFP, which is green fluorescent protein or yellow fluorescent protein um, that's derived from a jellyfish or whatnot, and we tag proteins because we want to see where those proteins are and what they're doing and where they're going and so on and so forth. So sometimes it's not about messing things up, uh, such as mutagenesis. Sometimes it's saying, I really want to see where this protein is being expressed, so I'm going to tag it with a GFP or something like that. So I made chickens glow green um, to see where this gene was being expressed.